Hello and welcome. I'm excited to have a session with the CEO of Nanit, Sarah Dorsett. Uh, she and I have worked together for the last couple of years. Uh, we're so pleased to be able to share uh, today with you some of the observations we have of what the technology market looks like post-pandemic. So setting the stage and then I'll jump into Q&A. Back in March of 2020, we thought the world was headed for a major downturn in the technology sector. Uh, we called people like Sarah and we prepared her to cut costs and shore up the balance sheet and prepare for the worst. And a really strange thing happened. And what happened is the opposite. And the opposite is we saw this massive boom in tech. We saw a boom in e-commerce. We saw a boom in things like telemedicine. We saw a boom in how food is delivered to us, how education is delivered to us, and even in how we meet uh, as individuals. And it started to make me realize that the most fundamental thing that has changed is the acceleration of technology. And here's what I mean. When you think about technology and how it impacts society, it's been a slow linear adoption curve and society changes every year. And it changes in ways that we don't even really perceive. For example, I'm sure everyone watching this video streams video on Netflix, on Hulu, Amazon Prime, and don't even give much thought to the fact that 10 years ago, that would be unimaginable. We all watch videos on our phone 10 years ago, that would be unimaginable. Our groceries are delivered to our houses, that would be unimaginable. So the technology shifts don't become perceptible, but in the last year, we have pulled forward three to five years of societal change, and that's what's caused the boom. Uh, I run a venture firm called Upfront Ventures. 90% of our portfolio is up, 90%. And when I say up, I mean most of the companies are up 100% or greater year over year. And you don't see that kind of technology shift happen often. And what my observation is, is that the technology shift is permanent because when you go to meetings where you're gonna be on a Zoom and we get used to not traveling for meetings, when your groceries that used to be delivered, now you have everything delivered, you're not gonna go back to the way of life before. And when you start realizing that you actually can see your doctor over a video conference, you're never gonna to wanna to go back to waiting for 45 minutes in the waiting room with all the other sick patients. Uh, so that's really what's happening and it's happening everywhere. And I'm really excited for Sarah to tell you about what's happening at Nanit. Nanit's a company that I invested in just over five years ago. Its hero product is a baby monitor, but the company is so much more than that as we all wear Apple watches and have this quantified self Nanit is really the quantified baby, but I'm going to let Sarah Dorsett tell you about it. So why don't you first tell us what is Nanit and what attracted you to the company? Thank you, Mark. I'm really excited. As you know, I'm always excited and can talk forever about Nanit. Um, well, I've always been, you know, my whole career, I've been um, sort of technology focused. In fact, I've been sort of in awe of, of the power of tech. And I think that um, Nanit was just, uh, so it was not, you know, when I kind of fell into Nanit, it was, you know, it wasn't foreign to me to be able to, to use technology. In fact, I've exploited technology, I would say, in my career. Um, but I remember my husband saying, you know, you sold millions of products, you're actually going to just go sell a baby monitor. And I remember thinking, but this is so much more. This baby monitor is going to change the world. Um, and I really, really still believe that. Um, so I was so inspired by um, the founders and how the foundation of the product was really built um, to support parents, to help parents, that it used technology in, in an extremely safe, extremely thoughtful way. Um, and the mission of the company was really to provide this incredible tool for parents to learn about their babies, um, to become better parents, to feel more confident. Um, and being a parent myself, that was just, uh, I, there was no way I could say no. <laughs> But Sarah, I notice you're wearing, it looks like an aura ring to me. Is that an aura ring? It okay. is. <laughs> so I, I recognize that because I wear one every night. And what it's done for me is help me sleep better. And I've gotten um, a, a, my head around this idea of deep sleep and REM sleep and how to balance those two things. I track my overnight heart rate and I track a respiration rate, so my breathing rate. Mm -hmm. And you know, we at Nanit do a lot of this. Maybe you could talk about how health related to babies has to be different than the Aura Rings or Apple Watches that we wear as adults. 
Well, I think there's a couple of things. One is that, you know, babies are so new to this world and they change so fast. Um, the first pillar of development for babies is really sleep. So getting babies to sleep, learning, training them on how to sleep, getting them to kind of sleep through the night. That's the very first thing that you, you know, outside of kind of feeding and diaper changes and kind of your daily routine, um, getting babies into a really healthy sleep pattern and a really healthy, it's part of their overall routine. And they, it really takes up at least half of their life, you know, half of their day at least. So what Nanit does is, is really help parents understand how are babies sleeping and then what else is happening in that crib. So that's what's kind of incredible is there's so much more going on in that crib. Babies are developing in the crib, not just through sleep, but they're also babbling and they're moving and they're learning. But how does it, how does it do that? I mean, like what does a camera actually do for you? Ah, so Nanit itself, I should maybe go back. It's a good question. Um, Nanit uses uh, computer vision technology um, and then kind of advanced AI and even deep machine learning um, to record what baby's doing and kind of package and identify um, different moments, developmental moments, um, especially sleep. So we can tell you how long baby slept, when they fell asleep, how often parents went in and checked on them, how often they woke up, um, what is their sort of sleep efficiency? So much like the aura ring, some of the same things that I look at every morning with my own sleep, you can see through Nanit too, but in a slightly more user-friendly way, I would say, because this is babies. And especially if you're a new parent, you don't really know what to expect from that baby. So we try to make it very simple. So we package up in sort of a daily dashboard. In fact, you also get sort of a time-lapse video in the morning. So you really get to see what did baby do that night when you were so far away from them, because it's so hard to, to to leave your baby in that crib. So we use technology to really um, uh, understand what's going on in that crib space. One thing I might like to emphasize, Sarah, if it's okay, is the difference between our connected self, quantified self, which is we can wear electronics on our finger, we can wear electronics on our arm. You can't really do that with a baby. So the beauty of computer vision is the ability to interpret what's happening in the physical world without electronics. So how we do that is Sarah designed apparel. So it's clothing and the clothing has absolutely no electronics on it. But what it has is a pattern. And you could imagine that when a baby is breathing and its chest goes up and down that the pattern changes like my hand is changing. And computer vision can determine respiration rate from the pattern that's shifting. It can determine height, it can determine weight, it can determine head circumference. So really what you're developing is a healthcare company and developing a corpus of real-time infant information to help parents in their journey. Uh, I want to shift gears if I could, Sarah, and talk about the pandemic so that we can share with people what observations we have about the pandemic. So rewind a little bit. March 2020, we had come off two years in a row of 120% year-over-year growth. I call you and say, prepare for the worst, and that... You know, we did go through some hiccups. Maybe you could rewind us like those first few months. What were they like and what did you learn about what's changed? Well, for us, the pandemic really started much earlier because of where we manufacture. Um, and we can go into that a little bit later. But if we're really looking at March, um, I think, you know, my first thought was, you know. Gosh, so, sir, take, take us to January because you were impacted. Like, in a way, you, we saw the canary in the coal mine. You know, I actually realized that something bad was happening in January through Nanit. Yeah, well, I mean, being a smart, being a startup, when you only kind of have one manufacturing facility, you only have that one facility in China, and the pandemic is actually going strong there before it even anybody's even talking about it in the U.S. Uh, we were dealing with it back in December, so you know, factories kind of shutting down and trying to figure out where inventory was going to be, and everyone who imported from China was trying to gobble up inventory. So for us, it was. It was really navigating through um, production uh, in China when they were dealing with it. And then, of course, we hit sort of the U.S. because our business was still strong in the U.S. Um, so we hit the U.S. in March after dealing with kind of how do we get these cameras out, uh, buying behaviors changed with our wholesale partners. Um, and then we hit the U.S. in March. And like you said, everybody kind of um, braced for impact. And I've been through this a few times in my career. So my first instinct was, okay, are we going to be impacted or not? Um, because we just don't know what's going to happen. Second was, you know, this is a $300 baby monitor. That's our entry point. Um, if the economy is going to just, you know, nosedive, 
are people going to spend $300 on a baby monitor or are they going to go spend 20 bucks on something easy or, 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 you know, come up with some alternatives. So that's the first thing we did was plan for kind of this, this downturn. But what's really been interesting about um, Nana in general is, you know, we can sort of build anything with our technology. Um, and I loved what you said earlier about it being so safe and it being computer vision and, 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 and the opportunity that opens up that it's, it's not electronic. There's nothing unsafe about it. It's just so natural. But we had really focused on sleep being our, um, our value proposition, even though we had so many different opportunities and, and, um, and features in the camera, you know, you can only really promote three or four of them to get people to really kind of, it, to sink in, to, to hook people, get them to, to want to make, choose us and make that purchase decision. And so we had really focused on, you know, sleep. We're very different because we can do all this sleep training and help you with sleep. Um, but we really took a look at, um, are there other things, you know, in this, in this um, pandemic world that could help uh, parents through our camera and through our technology. And in addition to sleep and helping parents sleep, which wasn't the first thing on everyone's mind when the pandemic hit, the first thing on everyone's mind was, am I going to get sick? How do I stay safe? What do I do? I'm bringing this new life into the world. Oh my gosh, I can't share this experience with my family and friends. Um, and one of the unique features that was always built into Nanit, because the idea of sharing the experience of what's going on with your baby, not just with family, but also with healthcare providers, was to um, come up with solutions within the app experience and the camera itself to share the baby experience, but to be able to give put parents in the driver's seat with it. So it wasn't just handing out some logins so that maybe- so give, me, give me a concrete example. What is it you do now? What is the emphasis now versus pre-pandemic? The emphasis pre-pandemic, like I said, was, was pretty sleep focused, pretty and smart. Today it is what? Today it's about connecting, keeping parents and families connected. So we use the camera itself to, um, to keep parents connected with other, you can have in the app itself, there's permissions that you can set. So you can invite grandma, you can invite your aunts and your friends. Yeah, I don't, and, I don't want to bury the lead here, Sarah, because I know what you did. <laughs> we emphasize grandparents. Yes, we did. Suddenly you had this elderly population that wanted to see the grandchildren and couldn't. And we did a shift in how we communicated. We did a shift in making sure the product teachers could invite in grandparents. And we're still in that world. We're still in a pandemic world where the people who are dying are mostly 75 and up. Mm -hmm. But the people who are 75 and up who are grandparents want to see their grandchildren. And using technology, that, talk about the society shift. You're now in a world where grandparents are becoming more adept at tools like this because it's the only way they can stay connected. I think about my mother-in-law who lives in a senior care facility. We haven't seen her in a year. Uh, and, you know, sadly, a year ago, her husband passed. And, like, technology is what binds us together. And I think that's really something that's changed post-pandemic. Yeah, it's been huge. I mean, we get, a, we get so much feedback about how – you know, grandparents are, are, can stay connected and stay involved and love being involved. You know, they can talk to the baby in the crib. They can act as little mini um, babysitters or a backup, you know, when you have to jump in the shower. And so it's just, it's, it's really become, I think, a, an incredible tool. And we really leveraged um, that, um, that benefit. And that was like, let's say the first six months post pandemic, and I think the second thing we realized, and I think this took us a little bit longer, but now like is remote pediatrics and where that's going. Because the idea that you could have your child monitored by a pediatrician, by a device like this was something that I think parents and pe pediatricians themselves um, weren't ready for. And now they suddenly realize as a parent, wait a second, I actually could do this and not drag my three kids, you know, to spend an hour and a half, you know, waiting for a pediatrician. My father was a pediatrician. And so I grew up in that world. And the idea that a pediatrician could see three times more patients without necessarily having to be in the office, I think that's something that's starting to shift. You know, are you observing any of that societal change? Well, we hear from parents all the time that they love to use kind of their nanny. Um, with their pediatrician, even just from a sleep perspective, because again, that's kind of the, for those are the first questions that are asked. Um, we know that pediatricians are really excited about um, what Nana has to offer and what it can do. And what we really believe is the benefit of Nana, the more, uh, the more parents become more and more adjusted to 
to kind of that that data addiction that you get with the monitor itself, we fill in the gaps between the visits. You know, you only have one visit per month for those first maybe six months. You get about 15 minutes, maybe half hour with your pediatrician, but then you have a whole nother month and baby again is developing so fast. And then it can bring you a, an entire trend of kind of what's happening and how they're developing and what's going on. And so we, we are definitely seeing kind of a shift into, um, into parents kind of craving the data, embracing the data. And then pediatricians have told us that, you know, there's no going back now in terms of well visits. Well visits will stay virtual if they can, um, because it's just so much safer. It's safer than- Well visits meaning uh, I'm not sick, I'm just going in for a routine check, is that right? Your regular checkup when you first, you know, have your baby, you're going in once a month just to see how baby's developing and how they're doing. And we have so many tools. Um, We have tools that can help you measure baby, which is a huge, you know, growth, sort of weight and height and head circumference are kind of those three measurements that are always kind of measured. And Nana can actually do that. Um, We definitely have the capability to do that. And if you can imagine, if you just have that tool and then you have this kind of virtual visit with your doctor, you can round out everything in such an incredible way. Just uh, in the interest of making sure we stay relevant to the people here, I want to talk about fundraising. Okay, so... I know we can't tell specific details, but I think we can talk at a high level because we haven't announced our raise yet, but we raised $25 million during the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> number one, what was it like fundraising during the pandemic? You know, what were the pros and cons and how did that work? And given pandemic, how hard was it to attract? I mean, we have a, like, I think we're going to shock people a little bit with the quality of the investor that came in and led the $25 million round. Um, What do you think attracted them? So maybe those two questions. Well, I think fundraising during that, well, this was my first legitimate fundraiser. So for me, everything was new. Um, I'd envisioned kind of this, you know, roadshow where I'd be traveling all the time. Um, And that wasn't the case. It was, it was, um, learning how to engage an audience over Zoom <laughs> and try to keep them engaged, um, you know, four or five times a day. So it was, it was this kind of constant kind of on visual, but um, I think pitching during the pandemic, um, one of the most interesting and challenging things is making sure that you grab attention and you have that, you're, you're kind of keeping that conversation going because it's so different from being kind of live and, and watching um, and, and trying to pivot into, into certain questions and reactions. Um, so I'd say, you know, very different, um, but for me, not having a, a ton of, you know, history in it, um, you know, that's, it's all I know now. So hopefully um, when things change a little bit, I'll be able to, to switch into that, the new mode as well. And then I think some of the challenges with our business have always been that, um, you know, the market is considered limited. Um, I don't consider it limited, but, you know, when you think of we're catering only to people who have babies, um, in my opinion, there's so much more that we can do. And it's really family focused, not baby focused. Um, I think there's always some sort of stigma around hardware and the complexities of hardware and what it, you know, what it takes to build hardware and what those multiples are. Um, So our, my challenge was really to overcome that because we're not a hardware business. Um, the, The hardware and the products that we create just tie back to this incredible experience that you get through through, through our app, this digital experience that you get. That's where the magic happens. That's where parents want to be. We just have these tools that help you get there that drive revenue. Um, so for us, it was really about making sure that we were able to convey that this is actually a good business. We've we've doubled year over year, you know, more than doubled last year. Um, we took advantage of the pandemic. We know how to do that. We have experienced leaders in this category. Um, and then it really kind of depended on the audience, to be honest, you know, those who really understood what you go through as a parent, they really perked up. Like this data is incredible. This information and what you're doing is so different from what we've seen before. And gosh, I wish I had that, you know, and, and I often found that when I was talking to I, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but oftentimes when I was talking to women, the kind of mom vibe um, was always much easier uh, to convey because the minute I would say certain things about, remember when, you know, you just couldn't figure out why that baby was waking up 20 times a night and, and don't you just wish you had this amazing tool to um, to help you sleep better and to figure out what was going on? Were they teething? Were they were they developing? Were they getting about to hit a milestone? Um, I think you really saw how powerful um, that was when you, when you talked to a parent who had really gone through that. So and I, get, 
I guess uh, if we go too much further, we might give away who it is because, uh, as you know, it was a female partner uh, and someone that we're really excited to work with. There's a term, Sarah, and uh, you probably know this in uh, economics called um, availability bias. And availability bias is we're biased by the decisions that, that are uh, the information that's right in front of us. And I find a lot of times that people's limitation in thinking about childhood development is limited by their availability bias. When we're talking to VCs who haven't had kids versus VCs who have, you know, you see a different reaction and understanding of the market. Uh, when I'm talking with male VCs or female VCs and the primary caregiver historically and understanding of taking care of children, the resonance was much higher. But here's the other interesting thing, and you touched on this, which is hardware. And I tell people this all the time. We were the uh, seed investor in Ring, the security camera. Amazon bought that for more than a billion dollars. And I always tell people, it wasn't a hardware company, it was a computer vision company. Our hero product was a piece of hardware, but the value was the subscription product that you bought with it. When you think about a Peloton bike, why is Peloton worth billions? It's hardware, but it's the software that you give. Uh, what is one of the most valuable companies we know of? It's Apple. They sell you a hard piece of hardware, but it's all the software and the app store and everything else that makes it so valuable. When you think about Amazon, you look at the Echo, you look at the Kindle. Hardware is an incredibly important way to bind your customer relationship as long as you have a higher margin software product that goes with it. So you talked about Nanit earlier, like our hero products, a camera, like you can't, you can't create computer vision without a camera or a laser or a microphone or some other technology. So we have this sensor, but the value is the subscription products that we're selling at higher margin that allow us to have not just a corpus of real-time data, and it's now the largest corpus of real-time data in the country for infants, but also the memories that are created, the photos, the videos that you're storing that people then uh, can share and the health information and how much value that's ultimately gonna provide. So I think investors who understand the power of hardware versus software are doing exceedingly well. I mean, all I have to say is SpaceX and Tesla, and you know, I can kind of drop the mic right there that hardware is an incredibly important part of the future. And that's what I'm excited about Nana. But the last point I wanna cover is being a leader. During a time of pandemic, you've got a team, you were used to going into the office, you're an inspirational leader. I know that people gravitate towards you, not just your executive team, but the board is really uh, warm to your leadership over the last couple of years. But it's a challenge to have everyone remote and you've got your own family. Uh, how do you deal with the leadership challenges post pandemic? You meet my family every time we talk, I think. <laughs> <laughs> um, I. Uh... I, I think, well, we had the benefit um, because we're sort of a global company. We have offices you know, overseas as well. So um, the nice thing is that we, when we all had to go remote, we were used to traveling a lot. We were used to, to doing a lot of things remotely. So at least we weren't in this kind of position where we'd never really had that. Um, so shifting into the mode was, I think, a little easier for us um, in some respects. I think some of the challenges that we've had, though, overall is, um, you know, again, staying connected. So one of the foundational things um, that we did was leverage, um, you know, this new value that we were offering or that we were promoting. And that was how do we as a company live what we sell, which is um, staying connected? How do we stay connected? Um, and we I mean, we've done everything, I think, from a a social, you know, leadership perspective, um, we've had all sorts of kind of um, really fun things to kind of keep people together. Um, but that is only a piece of it, right? What we really need to do is also make sure that we stay in business um, and staying connected in order to stay in business um, is very different from just kind of doing some of those social things and bringing people together and, and, and testing that out. Um, so I think a lot of the things that we had to do right out of the gate was to be one very visible, very transparent, um, really helping people kind of understand along the way what was going on with the company. And I remember there being 
some pretty incredible shifts. We would bring the whole, you know, company together over Zoom, so it was all virtual. Um, we'd talk a lot about kind of what was going on in the world and what we were seeing, um, and we didn't really hold back. We didn't we didn't do anything that was really um, we didn't go to extremes in terms of terrifying people about what was happening. But we said, look, you know, our um, we're going to stay the course. You know, we're going to keep doing what we're doing. We have a plan. It's been working for us. There's a lot of um, interesting things that we can shift and think about. And everybody in this company can be a part of that. And I want everybody's input. Um, these are new and interesting times, but we're a family and we're a family company. And the last thing um, that we'll ever look to as a family is, um, you know, is, is to make cuts. So in order to not have to go into some of those more, you know, dire, um, you know, uh, decisions, why don't we start to look at what, what it is we're really working on it and what we can do to shift and change? So we really spent a lot of time together um, as a team making decisions about what we were going to continue to work on, what we were going to pull back on, and how we were going to make sure that we, we kept this company alive and, and really shifted the culture into one that was still really productive, supportive, efficient um, during, uh, during a time when we couldn't come together. And one of the biggest challenges is really product development you know, developing products. We have this great opportunity to develop all of these amazing products because of the type of- um, um, Internet, oh, sorry. sorry. Uh, I, I saw some internet challenges. I don't know if it was on your side or mine, but I think what I'd like to do, Sarah, is give you some observations of uh, how I've observed your leadership changing, sure. if that's all right. And we haven't had a chance to talk about this in advance, <laughs> but one of the reasons I think you're super effective is your communication ability. We were in a cadence where we would have quarterly board meetings and then you would update us somewhere midpoint by email, uh, via phone call. And I think the cadence of us talking has increased massively, that we end up in a lot more 20 minute quick Zoom catch ups where I feel like we build a stronger rapport more frequently rather than a big drop every quarter. I noticed that with a lot of companies, but I think you and I have done that really well and we've incorporated other members of the board. And I think that keeps us more informed and making more rapid decisions uh, than we otherwise would make if we waited for quarterly board meetings. That's been incredibly effective. I know you've done that with your team. Um, I think one thing that you can overlook is the importance of global supply chains. I think the pandemic brought to us the importance of having a single country as your supply chain and the difficulties of that. Also, the Trump administration brought that front and center as they created more conflict with China. Um, I know that we've diversified our, our supply chains now where we're manufacturing in multiple countries. I think your focus on making sure that we didn't have to make job cuts meant that we had to improve our margins. One way that we improved our margins, of course, you've led the initiative of launching apparel, apparel being a higher margin, but still valuable because it pairs with the camera. But now that we sell a higher margin product, it allows us to keep our costs on the hero product in check. <clears throat> but you guys redesigned, and I know it's not announced, so I won't spoil your announcement, but you've redesigned the entire camera to massively take out costs of manufacturing while increase, increasing the production. And to think that you did all this post pandemic is just really phenomenal that you were able to keep that level of focus. I'm so grateful to get to work with you and watch your performance over the years. And I'm really excited because I know in the next 30 to 60 days, we're going to announce this round. We're going to announce our next product. We're going to announce a series of things. Uh, but I thought today was a good chance for you to share some of the things going on inside a fast growing tech company. So thank you so much to Sarah Dorset, and thank you to everyone really at Nanit uh, and to Super Returns for having us.